Okay, uh, so let's uh, do a quick review of last lecture. So last time we started talking about gyroscopes and uh, we started by basically developing a mathematical framework that enables us to study rotations, right? The physics of rotating bodies, basically. And specifically, we talked about um, different uh, reference frames or coordinate systems. So if you have a fixed frame S0 and a rotating reference frame S sub R with some angular velocity vector omega, then we showed that uh, a given point that is moving in both reference frames, uh, um, some point P of T, uh, we showed how the time derivatives of the position are related in the two reference frames. So the time uh, derivative P dot in the fixed frame is equal to the time derivative in the rotating frame plus this extra term omega cross P, so the vector cross product of your angular velocity vector and the position. And uh, in terms of physical quantities, these are velocities, right? So to, the velocity you observe in the fixed frame uh, is, is going to be, of course, different from the velocity you observe if, if you're tied to the rotating frame. And this mathematical expression exactly shows you the relationship between the two. Now, from there, uh, we uh, started looking at the forces that are observed in uh, the two uh, reference frames. Uh, why forces? Because inertial sensors, as we know, uh, measure uh, forces. Um, so that was done by basically starting from uh, uh, Newton's law, F equals m times a, and then taking uh, the, the second derivative of, of the position. So basically taking another derivative of, of, of this equation, and then we were able to uh, relate the forces. And this is the expression we came up with, that the force in the uh, rotating reference frame, F in SR, is equal to the force in the fixed frame plus three additional terms. Uh, the first one is called the Coriolis force, and it's given by this expression, minus 2m omega cross p dot, so it's proportional to the angular velocity of the, of the rotating frame and the velocity of the particle in the rotating frame p dot. Uh, then there's the centrifugal force, which is given by this expression, minus m omega cross omega cross p, so it is proportional in a way to the position of, of the particle and the square of the, of the angular velocity. And finally, you have your Euler force, which is given by this expression, minus m omega dot cross p, so it's proportional to the position of the particle and its angular acceleration, right? So this is omega dot here. Um, and specifically, we said the type of accelerometer that we're going to study in detail, which is a, a vibratory mechanical accelerometer, essentially measures the Coriolis uh, force or the Coriolis acceleration, so this F divided by M, that would be your uh, Coriolis acceleration, and that, uh, or the magnitude of, of that acceleration, a, a Coriolis, is going to be directly proportional to the angular velocity and also proportional to, of course, the linear velocity of the, of, the, of the particle. So if the linear velocity is known and you can measure the Coriolis acceleration, you basically, by this simple equation, you can find out what the angular velocity uh, was. And this is the, the principle of operation of the type of um, gyroscope that we are going to study in detail. So essentially, with, with, with all the math that we developed and the physics that we did on top of it, and we basically got to this point, um, this is something very actionable because it essentially tells us that if we can build a very specific type of accelerometer that can measure Coriolis acceleration, by doing this simple math, you can essentially make it a gyroscope, right? So the gyroscope, or this specific type of gyroscope you're studying, down the hood, it's, it's really an accelerometer. But it's measuring a very specific type of acceleration, which is the Coriolis acceleration. And then that can be easily converted to angular velocity, right? Um, OK, and then we started uh, looking at, essentially, the, uh, the, the, the mechanical architecture of, uh, of this type of accelerometer uh, given uh, in, in this uh, figure here. So inside the device, and this is a one-dimensional one, um, so it is going to measure uh, angular velocities uh, that 
are uh, uh, with respect to uh, the axis that is going in and out of the plane. So this uh, orange um, arrow here shows you the direction of the, the rotation or the angular velocity that the device will measure. And internal to the device, it's again a damped spring mass system, which shouldn't be a surprise because we said down the hood, this is really an accelerometer, right? But it's going to measure a very specific type of acceleration. And the way that is achieved, basically it has uh, two uh, axes of, of, of motion that are perpendicular to each other. Uh, one is called the drive axis or the, or the drive direction, also called the primary mode of the, of the device. And in this axis, called that X sub R, we basically actively drive the, the, uh, this um, harmonic oscillator with some drive force F sub D. Okay, so that force is generated internally in the device with some actuation mechanism that we'll talk about. So if that, so that force is gonna cause some uh, movement in the XR direction, right? And then on top of that, if you have some angular motion or angular velocity uh, with, uh, in, in uh, uh, in, in omega, uh, what happens is that the two will generate a Coriolis acceleration in the perpendicular direction, which we call y sub r, and that's called the secondary mode or the sense direction. Okay, let's make sure this, this makes sense. So if I go um, here to the, to the projector, again, uh, you're going to have your primary mode generating velocity in this direction in xr, and then you have your uh, uh, angular velocity uh, that we want to sense, defined by omega coming out of the plane. So as we know, the Coriolis acceleration is given, or the vector is given by omega cross uh, the, the, the linear velocity, right? So linear velocity is in x direction, omega is out of the plane, you do your right hand rule, so the Coriolis acceleration is going to be in the y sub r direction. So, so then I think everything should make sense. So now we have this accelerometer in the sense direction, and the acceleration that it would sense is going to be the Coriolis acceleration. So we measure that acceleration, and then with some simple math, we should be able to, in principle, find, find omega. Does this uh, make sense? Okay, so now we're gonna essentially analyze this, you know, write all the equations and de derive the, the, the full, you know, uh, uh, mathematical analysis of it, uh, but uh, I would, really want to ask you to, after class at some point, really, you know, um, study this. There's a lot packed in this simple diagram. And, um, you know, we started with some abstract mathematical framework of, you know, framing uh, rotating frames of reference and fixed frames of reference, and then we drive these uh, pseudo forces or fictitious forces, and, and then uh, we kind of get to this point that uh, we, have, we, have, uh, we have a mechanical architecture for a gyroscope. Um, but really, I think the, 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 the really clever, the genius idea behind uh, how, how, how this type of uh, gyroscope works, it's all packed in this figure. You know, it really takes uh, a lot of creativity to, to, to take a very abstract, mathematical or physical idea, something like the Coriolis effect, and really get something useful and actionable like a sensor out of it. And, and that's really the type of um, you know, creativity that requires a deep understanding of the mathematics and physics, and also the requirements of, of sensors, and really you know, bridge the gap there and design something from first principles. So, so really make sure to spend some time because uh, there, is, there is a lot really happening in this, uh, uh, in this diagram. And I don't mean just, you know, just the math or just the physics. Really think about, you know, somebody came up with this. And what was that thought process that goes from something very abstract, like the math on that board, to something very practical, which is, which is this design. Uh, and, and I think that's a very uh, interesting thought experiment uh, uh, for you. Okay, so let's, uh, let's look at the physics of it then. So essentially, we have two independent spring mass systems uh, in, in this device. And uh, for each of them, uh, we can um, write the force equations. So uh, let's uh, first write the equation for the drive direction. 
So the total inertial force in the x direction, or x of r direction, which is our drive, uh, is, is mass times acceleration. And everything here, we are writing our equations all in the internal reference frame of the device, right? Um, so this is, everything is, is internal to the device right now. Uh, so mass times acceleration, and it's the sum of three forces, right? You have your spring force, you have your dampening, and uh, you have your drive force, which is actively generated inside, inside the device, right? So uh, what about the uh, sense direction? The sense direction, the force in the sense direction is the mass times the acceleration in y sub r. And that also is the sum of three components. You have your spring uh, force, you have your dampening force, and you have the Coriolis force, right? So, so really, this third term is what uh, differentiates the force in the uh, drive direction with the force in the in the sense uh, direction. Now, uh, essentially, we can plug in expressions for for all of all of these terms, right? Um, so, uh, for let's do the the, the spring and dampening uh, expressions first. We just like the case of accelerometer. Go with the simple. Uh, you know, linear models for the spring with the Hooke's law and a, and a linear damping factor uh, with some uh, 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 constant b. So then the primary mode equation uh, becomes this, uh, x double dot plus b over mx, so that's the, the dampening term, uh, plus uh, kx over mxr, that's the, that's the spring term, equals F sub D over M, and F sub D is the, again, it's the active force that we are, we are driving the mass with. And your secondary mode becomes, essentially the left-hand side is the same, so you get like Y double dot, and then you get your uh, dampening term, and you get your uh, spring term. And then the right-hand side, this minus two omega X dot, this is the, uh, the, the Coriolis term, right? Um, this is that omega cross uh, xr. What happened to the vector cross product? Well, here we can uh, simplify it because we can, we're writing equations separately in x and y axes. And we know that by design of, of this device, omega and xr are perpendicular, right? So omega is out of plane, x, uh, the, the mass movement is restricted to the plane. So when you do the cross product, that sine theta term becomes one, right? That's sine of 90 degrees. Okay, so let's actually write it down to make sure it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's clear. So the actual Coriolis term is uh, omega cross essentially um, um, the uh, x dot, right? But this is the x dot vector, right? The actual uh, movement of the, of, the, of, the, of the proof mass. But the magnitude of it ba basically becomes uh, magnitude omega, uh, magnitude x dot, sine theta, that's the magnitude of your uh, Coriolis effect. There's like a factor of two also here, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just looking at the, at the cross product for now. Um, and then um, to, to simplify the math, we have, uh, uh, instead of like norm omega, we're just writing that as omega, so that's just a notational thing. But this sine theta becomes one because theta is 90 degrees by design, and then uh, your velocity is, is just this x, x dot r, right? So that's, that's what the Coriolis term is. We have just uh, um, simplified the math there, okay? So let's solve it. Uh, and uh, to solve it, of course, we need to decide how to, what, what uh, driving force we need to generate inside the device. How are we going to drive this uh, uh, um, uh, proof mass? And the way it's uh, driven, uh, um, and that's why these devices are called vibratory uh, uh, um, gyroscopes, is that the driving force is, is a harmonic term. So it's just some F0 times e to the j omega d uh, times t. So omega d is the, is the driving frequency, and you just generate the sinusoidal uh, uh, drive force uh, to, to, to move the mass. Um, again, this is not just, uh, if you remember when we were doing uh, accelerometers, uh, we said the external force first we started with just a pure harmonic term and then we generalized it using the, 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 the Fourier theorem to um, any, any time domain waveform. Here, the device is generating this and it's always just a pure sine wave, right? So here we are not doing like a simplification or you know like an isolated analysis. This is the waveform that the device actually generates. It's, it's just a pure sine wave. Okay, uh, 
So uh, we plug that in, and uh, uh, we can first uh, solve the uh, dynamics in the in the drive axis. So our x sub r, exactly like uh, we solved a case of the accelerometer, becomes basically this expression here, which is a zero over. This should be very familiar from the. Uh, analysis of the accelerometer. You have some omega zero squared minus omega drive squared plus JB omega D over M times the, the same basically complex exponential term. So you can just write that this is this is a constant, right? A zero is just your F zero over, over the uh, mass. And then uh, the omega zero X is just KX over M. So it's the spring constant in the X direction over M. Uh, and uh, omega D is again known, that's the, the drive frequency of the device. So all of this, you can just lump it into some X zero. Um, so your uh, dynamics in the drive is just a, a, a pure harmonic with some X zero e to the uh, J omega DT. Now we can plug this X R into the uh, second equation for the sense axis and find our um, displacement in the sense direction, right? So we start again with uh, knowing the fact that because it's a linear dynamical system and we are driving it with a, 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 um, essentially a pure harmonic with frequency omega d, the response yr is also going to be some y0 e to the j omega dt. Plug that into the equation. So you plug this for y and this, uh, or this expression for x. And um, after um, just some straightforward math, again, um, you're solving another accelerometer equation, right? Uh, you get this. So you get y0 times this term, which again should be familiar, omega 0 y squared minus omega d squared plus j b omega d over m times our uh, complex exponential equals this thing on the right hand side, uh, that's just minus 2 omega x r dot, right? So what this guy is, is minus 2 uh, omega x dot r. So x dot r, if you differentiate this, you get a j omega d term, and uh, you have the x0, and that's what, what that is. OK? So uh, let's find our displacement in the sense uh, direction. So um, what the displacement becomes from this, you just basically divide both sides by uh, this term, and your uh, expression for your sense displacement is given by, by this expression here. What you can do is also uh, plug in for x0 this expression on top. So remember this here is our x0. Plug that into here, then you get this big ugly equation down below. Okay, there's a lot in here, but if you inspect it carefully, everything in this big fraction this is just one constant, right? Everything in here is known to us. We know a zero, that's just our, the, the, our F zero, which is the drive force over M. We know omega D, that's our drive frequency. Omega zero X and omega zero Y, these are known by uh, the fact that we know the value of the proof mass and the spring constants. Uh, BX and BY are just dampening factors. So all of this is just one constant, right? e to the j omega dt, that's also a com complex exponential with a known frequency. The thing that really, really, really matters here is this little omega that you can almost miss it if you don't look for it, right? So what is essentially uh, the key here is that the displacement in the sense direction is directly proportional to the angular velocity that we are trying to measure. So we did actually build a gyroscope, right? It is doing what it's supposed to do. So your secondary displacement is proportional to the angular velocity omega. Uh, again, the math gets a little you know, messy, but at the end of the day, all of this is just one big constant. You just plug in numbers into it, and that's essentially kind of like the sensitivity of your, of your device, right? So if you want a good sensor, right? You want it to give you a large response for uh, a, a small um, you know, value of omega, right? You want your response to be large and strong. So that means you want this factor here to be large, right? You want this to be large. Because that's essentially like the sensitivity of your, of your device, right? So if you want this to be large, uh, 
How do you make this large? Uh, you, you make the denominator, uh, the, the numerator large and the denominator small, right? If you start with the denominator, look at these terms. You have omega zero x squared minus omega d squared, omega zero y squared minus omega d squared. So how about we start with making these terms zero, right? That makes the denominator small, should help with the, with the sensitivity. So to maximize your sensitivity, Essentially, what you do is you, you uh, pick your values of your spring uh, constant and the masses and the mass such that, and also your driving uh, frequency omega d, such that both your primary and secondary modes are driven at resonance, right? And by that, we mean you can pick the same spring constant in the x and y directions, call that k. And uh, with that, then your omega 0 x and omega 0 y become the same, they were both equal to square root of k over m, call that omega zero. And then if you pick your omega d, again, remember, you're free to choose your omega d, that's your drive frequency. If you also choose your omega d to be equal to omega zero, then if you go back to the previous uh, expression, this term becomes zero and this term also becomes zero. That's gonna help with sensitivity, right? You make your, uh, this multiplicative factor large. Okay. So then also, your math simplifies a lot. A lot of, again, the terms become just zero. And you plug in these values to the, to the a big expression from the slide before, and it just becomes this uh, much more simpler expression. So your displacement in the sense direction becomes 2jm f0 times bx times by omega 0 e to the j omega t. So now, essentially, this term here is your sensitivity, right? And again, by making these choices for x, uh, for kx, ky, and omega d, we are maximizing our, our sensitivity. We're, we're uh, getting a larger response. OK. What matters at the end of the day is exactly like the case of the accelerometer, you measure uh, capacitively, as we'll see, the amplitude of this secondary motion and the amplitude of this, uh, again, this uh, uh, e to the j omega dt uh, term uh, goes away, and that's your basically amplitude response, right? So it's just some sensitivity factor times the angular, uh, um, angular velocity uh, omega, or basically that's, that's the sensitivity. Um, Another thing that, as you can see from this expression, helps with the sensitivity is uh, for your dampening factors to be small, right? So typically, uh, gyroscopes are designed to be underdamped, um, so small bees, right? Um, uh, unlike the, the case where for accelerometers that underdamping can cause issues like um, uh, slow uh, um, um, responses due to uh, oscillations in the transient response. For gyroscopes, we are driving them at resonance, right? So the thing is always vibrating. And uh, uh, because the amplitude of the response is given by this expression, having a small b, meaning under damping, it helps uh, in the case of a gyroscope. Um, why not uh, um, just remove damping altogether Make, make B zero or as close to zero as possible. Is that a good choice? Any thoughts? When you become too sensitive, like, then you can't measure it. Essentially, yes. I mean, too sensitive is, is not necessarily bad. But well, first, uh, in, in practice, we can never have zero dampening, right? Just, just by you know, natural frictions and things like that. There's always some non-zero B. So zero wouldn't even be practically possible. But also, you don't want, it to, want to make these as small as possible because uh, it can cause instability issues. So if your Bs are very small, the amplitude of the oscillations can, can grow, and your proof mass can, for instance, crash into the walls of the device and, and you know, cause really stability issues. So that's why you want some damping, but you always underdamp it um, so, so you get a, you get a uh, nice large uh, sensitivity out of this. OK, so, so that's, that's in summary exactly uh, what we said. We know um, what the response of the, uh, or the sensitivity of the, of the um, uh, gyroscope is. Also, from this expression, um, Again, to get the uh, largest possible sensitivity, uh, having a larger proof mass helps okay, for gyroscopes. Remember, for um, 
accelerometers, it, it didn't matter for sensitivity what the proof mass value was. But for gyroscope, it actually having a large um, helps, as, as you can see in this expression. You also want a nice large driving force, um, if possible. Uh, omega zero, I mean, from mathematically, it seems like smaller is better. But remember, omega zero also determines the bandwidth of your device. So usually, you don't have much of a choice for it. It's kind of dictated by the, by the application. OK, so let's talk about uh, the actuation, right? So we need to, for gyroscopes, we need to drive the mass and generate some actuator, uh, actuation force. And let's see how that is generated. Uh, in these types of devices, it's uh, generated using uh, electrostatic actuators. And these are also just capacitors, basically. Uh, so let's just start with a case of a simple parallel plate capacitor. So you have your two plates um, uh, with some voltage V0 applied across and some uh, uh, separation between the two. So as we know, there's going to be some charge buildup uh, by the amount of Q. And uh, the, your, your, your charge, the voltage applied, and the capacitance, there is a simple re linear relationship between the, between the uh, three quantities. So if you apply a voltage V0 to a parallel plate capacitor of capacitance C, the charge is going to be Q0 equals C times V0. Okay. What about the energy stored? In the, in the capacitor. So just by this process of the buildup of the charge, you're, you're storing some energy in your capacitor. And the energy can be calculated by just the integral of the, of the charge, uh, Q, um, times dV from 0 to um, whatever your final voltage is. So, so essentially, you're starting at 0 voltage and slowly ramping up the voltage across the capacitor. And that charge buildup with this integral uh, gives you the total energy. That, that you have in your capacitor. Uh, you plug in your uh, charge and voltage relationship. So for Q, you can substitute C times V. And then you carry out the integral. You get the famous expression of 1 half C times V0 squared, which is the total energy in a capacitor. Or you can write it in terms of the charge. Um, so it's 1 half Q0 squared over C. OK? So that's the total energy in a parallel plate capacitor. But we're not interested in energy. We want to find force, right? How, how much force can you generate with, with, a, with a capacitor in, in an electrostatic manner? OK. So let's assume that in this parallel plate capacitor, one of the plates, let's say the top plate, can move. right? Um, you um, let it move up and down. And with that, now we can talk about forces. right? So there's going to be some electrostatic force F that attracts the two plates. OK? And if you have some small movement of the top plate by some dx, um, what happens is that the movement consumes some mechanical, mechanical energy. And as we know, the energy, uh, the mechanical energy is the force times movement. That's the amount of mechanical work that you do by uh, moving that top plate by a small amount. So you have fdx. That's your uh, mechanical energy. But by uh, essentially uh, uh, conservation of energy, we know that that should equal uh, the amount of electromagnetic energy that you lose, right? So you convert some of the uh, stored uh, electromagnetic energy in your capacitor to mechanical work by letting the top plate move. Uh, with the electrostatic force, right? So the conservation of energy essentially gives you FDX, again, that's the mechanical energy, plus DE, which is the change in the, in the electrostatic energy should equal to zero, right? Now with this, we can now find we're, we're interested in the force. We're interested in how much force you can generate electrostatically. So your F just becomes the minus the uh, DE DX, which is the uh, derivative of your electrostatic energy with respect to um, the spacing between the uh, two uh, plates of the capacitor. And for E, if, if you can plug in the expression we just derived in the, in the previous slide, which was 1 half Q0 squared times uh, 1 over C. So essentially, you need to take the derivative of uh, 1 over C. Or you can write it in terms of voltage. And then your force becomes 1 half V0 squared DC dx, so the derivative of the capacitance with respect to x. So to find the force, essentially, we need uh, this DC dx term. 
which is dependent on the geometry of the capacitor, right? We need to know the exact geometry to, to be able to take the derivative of it with respect to x and then find force. Now, uh, we start with the simple parallel plate capacitor, uh, but uh, the actual geometries that are used in uh, uh, MEMS devices uh, are uh, essentially comb drive actuators. So, so these are kind of like the same uh, structure as, uh, that we use for sensing. Uh, these uh, comb structures are also used for, for actuation. Um, but the, the high level idea is the same. So you have your black is your uh, fixed electrode that has these fingers and then the blue is your moving uh, and then by the electrostatic force that you generate the top one can move up and down uh, with respect to the, to the bottom one. Uh, it has a simple geometry that we can uh, basically analyze analytically, essentially what you have is uh, between every two plates you have some capacitance, right? So you have capacitance here, capacitance here, capacitance here, and so on. And each of these you can approximate by a parallel plate capacitor. So it's kind of like you have n parallel plate capacitors side by side. Right? And we know how, uh, what the capacitance of a parallel plate is, so for a parallel plate Uh, capacitor C is epsilon zero A over D, is that? Okay, thank you, Sakshan. Uh, so it's proportional to the area of the plates and inversely proportional to D, which is the gap between the two plates times the uh, 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 permittivity of, of uh, vacuum. Um, so using that, essentially what we have here is say there is n of, of these gaps between the fingers. So you get a factor of n. Uh, the area A between the plates is equal to, essentially it's a, it's a two dimensional. So I assume it's, it's going in and out of the plane, right? Uh, um, uh, plane of the slide. And uh, then this area A uh, becomes, with the dimensions defined here, it becomes x0 minus x. So that's the, basically the length of the overlap between the two fingers times the height of it. And the height is not shown in this picture because it's 2D, but assume it's kind of like extruded out of the plane, and that's h. So h times x0 minus a, that is our uh, essentially area right, of the capacitive uh, plates. Uh, D is the gap, okay, so over D times epsilon zero, and N is how many of these you have, and that gives you your total capacitance, right? So very easy to analyze uh, in that regard. Now, uh, if we just take the derivative of this C with respect to X and plug it into the previous equation we had, that gives us a total uh, actuation force, basically. What's very nice about this is, it, you see, it's a linear function of x. So if you take the derivative, you just get a constant, right? Let's do it together. So what is dc dx here? dc dx is equal to, so we get h over d carries over, and we get n, and we get epsilon zero, right? That's it, with a minus sign. So that's our dc dx, basically. Plug that into um, the previous equation, basically this equation for force, and we get the total actuation force that you get with a comb drive actuator. Yes? Can you go back to the previous slide? Yes. Uh, so the area is h times uh, x naught minus x. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that there's like absolutely no influence from, um, from any of the uh, you mean from these areas? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, basically the question is, I'm, I'm going to reformulate your question, but I think the gist of it is, is, what about the capacitances from these portions, right? Essentially there is uh, capacitances here, right, and here and we're kind of ignoring those. And uh, you're absolutely right, there's a little bit of capacitance added, but if, you, if, if by design uh, you make the, this, this length here, so if you make this length much, much, much longer than, than this dimension here, uh, then essentially the contribution from these parts doesn't matter and, and you can ignore it, right? Uh, but, but you're absolutely right, there's a little bit of capacitance added from, you know, the, it's, it's not a perfect parallel plate, but it's so close, especially if you make your, your aspect ratio much uh, longer than what I've uh, drawn here, that then that, that part can be ignored, okay?
So we plug that in, and then we get our full uh, expression for our actuation force, which is equal to negative one half n times h over d. So, so all this here is just the geometric uh, uh, constant, right? N is the number of plates. H is the the gap between. Uh, uh, sorry, h is the height. D is the gap. Epsilon zero is the permittivity, and then v zero squared is your drive voltage or the amplitude of the of the drive voltage that you put on the capacitor. What's really really nice and useful about this design is that the force that you get again it's constant, so it's independent of how much the the, the plates have moved, and that really helps in the in the analysis of the of the um, gyroscope and also when it comes to calculating. Uh, angular velocity, the fact that you have a constant force really, really helps. So this is a very nice practical geometry for actuation, and that's why it's used a lot. And uh, what you do in practice is, um, you, you, again, as, as we said, you want to uh, uh, drive your uh, proof mass with uh, like a pure harmonic at a constant uh, frequency omega zero. And as you see, your force is proportional to V zero squared. So you just apply a voltage, a time varying voltage across this comb drive uh, capacitor uh, or, or comb drive actuator, which is some V zero uh, times e to the j one half omega t. Why one half? Because the force is proportional to the square of the voltage, as you see here. So you, you generate a voltage as at half your uh, drive uh, uh, frequency that you want, and then the force becomes this uh, pure harmonic, which is a bunch of constants, some geometric constants, and some v0 squared uh, times e to the j omega t, right? So that's how you derive, drive your, your mass at, at resonance uh, in this. So our analysis is now essentially complete. If you remember, when we, a few slides back, we, uh, uh, we derived this expression for sensitivity of the gyroscope. Uh, but we didn't say what F0 was, right, the, your drive force. Now we have an expression for F0. So essentially your F0 with this comb drive structure driven with a pure harmonic is given by this expression uh, here, which is NH over D times minus 1 half epsilon 0 V0 squared. Plug everything in, and this is your final expression for the sensitivity of your um, uh, vibratory gyroscope. Uh, and, and with this, again, you have everything, right? All of these are, are either design parameters that you can choose or otherwise known parameters. Uh, again, we want to maximize this to get the best sensitivity, so good choices you can make. Uh, as we said, choose your BX and BY small, so under damp it. Uh, choose your M large, large mass, right? Uh, large N and large H, so that's just, you know, maximize the capacitance of your comb drive actuators by either increasing the number of plates or decreasing the gap between them, or, or uh, increasing the height between them, or decreasing D, which is the gap between the uh, actuators' uh, plates, or do all of these together, and also uh, drive it with a large voltage also helps with, with the sensitivity. So again, uh, when it comes to like uh, MEMS engineers who are designing these devices, these are all design parameters that they can go and optimize. Yes? Like no one concerned about like dividing by a really small number? Because I know in like linear algebra when you divide by a small number, it, it's like unstable. That's a great question. So uh, the question is, uh, we have a bunch of parameters in the denominator here, and is there a concern of like if dividing by very small numbers causing instabilities or, or, or other issues? And you're, you're uh, uh, exactly right. Like specifically when it comes to these dampening factors, you don't want them to be too small because it can even mechanically, not just mathematically like dealing with large numbers, but these large numbers are tied to physical quantities, right? Like a very small b here, uh, it, it's just not a small number in, in our math. It means, for instance, that the, um, this, the, the mass is, is vibrating inside the device. And a small b means the amplitude of the vibrations is going to grow larger and larger and larger. And at some point, it can become so large that your proof mass physically crashes the internal walls of your device, and, and it can cause damage. Um, OK? OK, um, very good. So, so again, yeah, these are all design parameters, but 
these are, it's not just, yeah, go, go make your denominator as small as possible or your numerator as, as large as possible. There is a trade space always. Um, so as you make your m large, it can cause other issues. It can cause nonlinearities or other things or um, are, are, are very practical uh, fabrication issues. So that's why the design engineers really need to understand the process on one side and understand the system level, you know, metrics like this on the other side and then go optimize the, the design of the device for the specific application um, uh, in mind. Okay, let's look at uh, um, some uh, actual pictures of these MEMS devices. Uh, here's, uh, again, high level, you know, um, diagram of how these devices work. Again, this is the case of a 1D um, gyroscope. This should be pretty familiar, right? You have your proof mass with some springs anchored to basically the silicon wafer. And uh, the, the red uh, capacitive, capacitive place, those are your uh, actuators. So um, those uh, generate the uh, um, harmonic motion in the, in the, in the drive uh, direction. And then you have your green blue sense capacitors um, on the two sides. And then when the device, uh, when the proof mass moves up and down uh, uh, due to the Coriolis acceleration, uh, that's going to uh, get picked up by uh, the sense capacitors. Um, something very interesting here is that uh, the design is such that as the mass moves left and right in the XR direction, there is no net change in the capacitance sensed by your sense capacitors, which is this uh, blue-green capacitors. Because when it goes left-right, you're going to get reduced capacitance on one side and increase it on the other side, so the net change is zero. So you're insensitive to the movement that you're generating in XR. But if it goes up-down, then the capacitances on both sides are going to change in the same way, either go up or down, and that's how you, you that's why you're sensitive to Y movement, but you're insensitive to, to X movement when it comes to uh, picking things up. Um, and then dampening, exactly like accelerometers, is, is uh, uh, achieved in these MEMS devices by some inert gas in a sealed chamber and, and uh, viscous, uh, viscous dampening. Here's one picture of a, a one-axis uh, MEMS gyroscope. Uh, I think by now uh, you should be able to fully explain what's, what's happening here, right? So you have your proof mass. Uh, the, what's highlighted in red is your uh, uh, comb actuators to generate the, 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 the drive motion in, in this axis. So the mass is like constantly vibrating at some frequency omega d in this axis. And then in green you have your sense capacitors. So as soon as there is some rotation, uh, about an axis that is perpendicular to the plane of the device, what happens is that that rotation plus the actuation in uh, this axis together generate a Coriolis acceleration in the perpendicular direction, and that is going to be picked up by the capacitive sensors that are highlighted in green. And then these are the actual you know, um, 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 electron microscope images of um, the actual fabricated device. So you see the, your sense capacitors up there. Uh, this, I think, is the comb drive. Yes, that's the comb drive actuator. And these are the uh, capacitive uh, sense plates uh, that, that you have. Yes? Why does the system need uh, two green capacitors? Why can't it just have one on one side? Great question. So why do we have two, two green sense capacitors on both sides? There's, there's two reasons for it. One is more signal, right? You always want to get as, as much signal as, as you can. Um, so if there is, you know, some surface or area available to add more capacitive sense, uh, 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 sensors, you, you would do that. But also um, uh, because of uh, the thing we were talking about here, if you don't put one of these, right, just remove one side, okay, then what happens is that as you generate your drive, the mass is going to move to the left and right, right? Then you get a net non-zero change of capacitance on one side, which means you would couple your drive movement to what you want to sense, which is the, the Coriolis acceleration, right? So it just, the device wouldn't even function. You cannot decouple the 
from, from the perspective of your capacitive sensor, it's going to be sensitive to both movement in x and in y direction. And that's not desired. You want your capacitor to only respond to movement in the drive axis, which is due to Coriolis acceleration. When you put it on both sides, uh, when it goes left and right, one side is going to lose capacitance, the other side is going to gain capacitance, right? So there's a net zero change in capacitance on both sides. And that means you're insensitive to horizontal motion. You're only sensitive to up-down motion, which is the motion you want to sense. Okay, so that's that's also a very so it's not just to get more signal. That's nice, but also practically, if you remove one of these, your device wouldn't function because uh, it's 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 going to respond to both your drive movement and the Coriolis movement, which is not desired. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, one more picture to look at, our, our uh, favorite iPhone example, iPhone 4. Um, so if you remember for the accelerometer, we looked at this, this device, tiny one right here. There is another one right next to it, and, and that's the gyroscope. And then uh, it's actually a three-axis MEMS gyroscope. Fascinating design. I, I really, really highly encourage you to just like look at this picture and make sure you know every piece of it uh, makes sense. There's really a lot going uh, on in here. Uh, because it's, it's basically just four proof masses moving in two axes, but you can, with those, sense uh, uh, um, angular velocity in all three axes. Um, I mean, just visually, you know, just the, the, the fact that, like, it's uh, such an intricate, you know, design of, of MEMS apart, I think at a system level, uh, you should be able to really understand, you know, how the movement of these masses is related to, um, uh, to different angular velocities that you can apply to the device. Let's just, and it's, and it's, um, the MEMS structure is in two layers. So there's the bottom layer, which has these big capacitive plates for sensing pitch and roll. And then the top layer has the proof masses with the comb drives and also um, um, some capacitive fingers for sensing yaw. Um, if we just zoom in to the, to the top layer of the MEMS structure, uh, that's this. And everything is kind of like highlighted in different colors. Um, uh, one thing to note, I think I forgot to uh, um, put it down here, what is called pitch proof mass, this is for pitch and yaw. So these two green masses uh, with their movement enable the device to essentially move both pitch and yaw. Uh, and then you have your, your row, you have your comb drives, uh, there's a bunch of springs of course because these masses need to vibrate. Um, and then you have your, your sense plates. So um, just to understand the the dynamics of, of, of these masses, I think this picture really helps. Um, so first, again, you have four proof masses in the device, these kind of like trapezoidal looking things. And two of them, M1 and M3, are, are moving in this direction, right? And then M4 and M2 are moving in the perpendicular direction. And knowing that, then you can, uh, think of different uh, uh, angular velocities in three different axes, and then uh, that tells you, combined with the axes of motion of, of, uh, or vibration of these proof masses, that tells you what kind of dynamics you expect from different angular velocities. So um, let's do, I'll do one of them with you, and then I'll let you do the other two um, by yourself. So if, if you apply a yaw, so a yaw is a rotation uh, across the z-axis, right? So perpendicular to the, to the plane of the masses, right? So that's your omega axis. And uh, how does that affect, let's say, uh, M, um, M, M4 and M2, right? So M4 and M2, again, I'm going to go on the board here. Uh, so M4, M2 are, are moving in this direction, and then that Z is the axis of, of your omega. So you do omega cross the linear velocity of these two masses. So, so, so omega cross that, and then my, my thumb is pointing in the direction of the Coriolis acceleration. So the Coriolis acceleration due to yaw is going to move M4 and M2 in the direction shown by these yellow, uh, uh, red arrows, right? Uh, and with that, if you put capacitive sense plates uh, uh, accordingly, 
uh, then you can pick up yaw. And if you go to the previous picture here, you see that's why your yaw senses, the capacitive uh, fingers are placed there because uh, the, the Coriolis acceleration from yaw is going to move the masses. So that's going to be from yaw, right? And then it's going to be picked up by these yaw sense, uh, uh, basically. Um, plates. So make sure you really fully analyze this, and 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 everything should 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 make sense to you as you kind of like look at the look at the MEMS structure here. Any questions? Okay, so I have a question for you, and uh, my question is, if I go back to where we started with the mechanical architecture of the accelerometer. If if I go here, um, so now we fully know how this works. We did the math, you know, we even looked at the MEMS structure and everything, and I, I hope you're convinced that this is a proper uh, gyroscope. Now, my question is, uh, if, if we didn't know about gyroscopes yet, and I showed this to you and asked you what do you think this is, you would probably say an accelerometer, right? It's just a spring mass, down to spring mass system in two different axes, so, so you might have said it's probably like a two-axis accelerometer, right? And it is a two-axis accelerometer, right? Like if externally I apply acceleration in this direction or in that direction to the device, it's going to, through the springs, couple to the mass and cause, you know, the mass to move around, right? And there's always going to be external accelerations. So how does this device properly function if it's also sensitive to linear acceleration that's applied to it externally. Does that does the question make sense? Like I, I argued for like a good hour that or so that this is a proper uh, gyroscope, but I could argue also that this is a two-axis accelerometer. And if both of these are coupled and picked up by the device, how does it function? How can it tell angular velocity from linear acceleration? Anyone? Okay, so, so the answer is kind of like there's, there's two very clever things in the design that, that helps the device um, basically differentiate or, or only be sensitive to um, um, angular motion and not linear acceleration. Well, first thing is that you cannot fully decouple. So, so there is going to be a little bit of coupling from external linear acceleration to the device. And it's going to look like a little bit of added noise if there's external acceleration applied. But most of it you can fully filter out by two things. One is, remember, this F sub D, uh, V generated, right? And it's going to be driven at a very specific frequency, right? You pick your omega D, and that's the resonance frequency of the device. And your response in the sense direction is also going to be exactly at that frequency. So just by some filtering operation, if you only look at the response at omega d, right, if you do like a sharp band best filter and only look at that resonant frequency, uh, that's going to already filter out a lot of external acceleration that you can apply because it's probably going to be wide band and, you know, or, or completely out of band. So, so that's one, right? you only look at the frequency that you're driving it at. And that's going to uh, and filter everything else out. Um, now, having said that, it means that if somebody somehow knows what the drive frequency of your gyroscope is, they can uh, kind of disruptively uh, attack it. So they can generate, for instance, um, acoustic waves at that exact frequency and couple it to your device if they know the resonant frequency. And then they can really, really, really disrupt the performance of your device if they actually externally couple um, um, accelerations at that frequency. The, the second thing that helps you is if I go to um, this last picture we looked at. And this one is very dependent on the architecture of the device, but for this one specifically, for instance, if uh, we go back to, let me do it on the iPad here. If we go back to how, for instance, our, our um, yaw affects the, um, what kind of Coriolis acceleration it generates on the two masses, uh, you would see that from 
yaw, the two masses are going to experience Coriolis acceleration in different directions, right? And that's why these arrows are colored, because the reds are pointing to opposite directions. As you apply uh, angular velocity, one of the masses, for instance, it's going to, depending on the direction of your omega, uh, one of them is going to uh, experience a Coriolis acceleration in, say, northwest direction. The other one is going to experience it in southeast direction or something like that, if it makes sense, right? So the two masses are going to go in opposite directions. Again, it's going to be either like this or like that. So the signals that your uh, capacitive sensors are going to pick up are going to be having opposite signs if it's coming from uh, rotational motion, but they're going to have the same sign if it's coming from a linear acceleration. That's another very clever thing that by design lets you decouple rotation from linear acceleration. Make sense? OK, so there's two things, right? There's filtering. Just look at omega d. And also, by design of the device, uh, maybe you can look at the signs of things, if they're opposite signs or the same sign, and that helps you decouple. OK, uh, let's also talk a little bit about <coughs> excuse me, um, noise and resolution in uh, gyroscopes. Um, I'm not, again, going to um, go into the detail of the fluctuation dissipation theorem and all that. You can read about it. But the main takeaway is that you can, just like the case of accelerometers, uh, come up with um, uh, analytical expressions for the variance or the standard deviation of the noise that um, accelerometers experience. And these are, again, due to thermal effects, right? So thermal effects cause these random vibrations of the proof mass, and they are going to show up as some uh, random um, uh, angular velocities in the device. The expression for um, the RMS value, or the standard deviation of the noise, is given by this. So high-level takeaway for us is typically uh, a, angular velocities that are less than a standard deviation of noise, they're not going to be uh, 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 measurable, right? They're just like below noise flow. Uh, in some more sensitive applications, you might require things to be like above two or three or four sigma um, to, to declare them uh, detectable, right? Um, and then if you look at the noise variance or standard deviation, uh, it's uh, proportional to a number of things. Of course, the, the, the measurement bandwidth delta F is there. You have the temperature. You have the Boltzmann constant. But the damping factor is in there, right? So uh, smaller damping factors also help with reducing the noise in the device, right? Another reason to have these devices under damped. It's also inversely proportional to uh, mass displacement in the primary direction, and the resonance frequency of the device. So if those parameters are large, it will also help with reducing the noise that the device picks up. Um, so again, these go into design trade-offs as it comes to designing the actual MEMSA structure for these devices. Uh, if you look at the data sheets of actual devices, they typically give you, you know, noise curves. And what's uh, very interesting to note here is that uh, this is one from analog devices, and they give two different noise curves with vibration and without vibration. And the reason, as, as you see, with vibration, you're almost a little less than 10x, but almost 10x more noise, right? An order of magnitude more noise. And it's exactly because of what we talked about, because linear accelerations at least a little bit of it, will couple into the, the uh, gyroscope and will show up as effective noise, basically. And that's why with vibration, you get more noise uh, than without vibration. And this device has a resonance frequency of about, about 1 kilohertz. Um, any questions? OK, let's continue. So uh, we basically finished. Um, the, the, the discussion of accelerometers and gyroscopes. Uh, we know the physics of the devices. We did a system level analysis. We also looked at some uh, actual you know, fabrication details. Um, um, one thing to note is that uh, for both the accelerometer and the gyroscope, uh, we picked 
a, a very specific type of these devices, which was the MEMS uh, devices. There are other types of accelerometers and gyroscopes. There's, as we said, like uh, optical gyroscopes, for instance, that work on different uh, physics principles. Um, um, but the types that we covered, these are most common ones uh, and most useful ones for robotic applications, and that's why we, we covered this type. Now here, there's uh, one more um, uh, piece in this chapter uh, that, that I want to talk about. But before that, really quickly, just like the case of uh, the accelerometer, uh, you can also um, write a, a measurement model for a gyroscope, and it looks exactly like what an accelerometer uh, measurement model is. So essentially, um, you have your true underlying angular velocities, omega, and there is going to be some noise added to it, omega n, and these are, your, in the most general case, vectors in R3, right? If you have a three-axis device, so you have omega plus omega n. That's being multiplied by this three-by-three three matrix, which models two effects for you, right? A crosstalk and uh, uh, sensitivity variations in different axes. So your diagonal entries of your M, which we call alphas, those are sensitivity errors. Ideally, you want them to be all one, but in practice, there's going to be some deviation. And then the off-diagonal, the kappas, are your uh, uh, crosstalk, basically, terms. So that's when angular velocity from one axis couples and shows up as uh, angular velocity in a different axis. And then you also always have a bias term, beta, which is just a constant vector added. Um, these devices are typically well calibrated, so uh, your, your M is, is, is almost identical to, uh, almost the identity. If, if it's a well calibrated device, that's, that's what you get. So there's almost no crosstalk and almost no uh, gainers. Um, but, but I mean, in practice, it's, it's, it's never exactly identity. There's always a little bit of residual uh, miscalibration. Um, noise is noise, nothing we can do about that. And there's also always a little bit of residual bias. Um, and uh, device data sheets actually give you uh, these parameters. So they tell you, for instance, um, how much uh, crosstalk you should expect in the worst case or how much bias you should expect from your device. So these are parameters that if you're simulating the performance of your sensor, you can actually read them from a data sheet and, and, and plug in the numbers. Okay. Now, we are going to uh, talk about, so we know how these sensors work, the accelerometer and the gyroscope. Um, and uh, by the way, these days, uh, you can buy chips that uh, are, are both devices integrated into one, because these are both built on MEMS processes. So now, in the case of, for instance, iPhone 4, you, you saw there were two separate chips for accelerometer and gyroscope. Uh, uh, newer phones, it's just one chip, and it's both integrated into, into one die. In fact, there is also a third sensor that these days is, is integrated, which is a magnetometer. And that's kind of like a, like a uh, magnetic field sensor that acts like a digital compass, if you will. We didn't talk about it, but you will see it in the homework, or maybe you've already seen it in the homework. It's not an inertial sensor. It's a different kind of a sensor, but that is also integrated. So if you see things that say nine degrees of freedom sensor, that means you get three degrees of freedom from your accelerometer, three degrees of freedom from your gyroscope, and three degrees of freedom from a uh, magnetometer. So it's all combined in one, one chip, basically. Now, here in this next topic, which is inertial navigation, uh, we're going to dip our toes in the, in, the, in the land of perception, basically. So we're going to, if you remember at the start of the chapter, I told you um, um, one of the ways you can do uh, localization is via debt reckoning, right? So you basically integrate your uh, trajectory one step at a time. So we're going to look at that and, uh, and see how that is done using inertial sensors that we learned about. Again, dead reckoning, can, you can use different sensors to do that. You're going to look at the inertial version of it, basically. OK. So this is called inertial navigation. And it's, as I said, dead reckoning using measurements from accelerometers and gyros. And uh, there's a term for it. It's called inertial navigation system, or INS. So what an INS is, is basically it's, a, it's your IMU, which is an accelerometer and a gyroscope. 
plus a little bit of you know a, a, a extra compute in the form of like a DSP processor and a microcontroller that processes the signals from the gyroscope and the accelerometers and uh, essentially does a little bit of uh, uh, dead reckoning for you and gives you like trajectories or positions and velocities. So it kind of integrates the outputs of these, these two sensors. Uh, so that combined thing is called INS or uh, um, um, inertial navigation systems. So when it comes to you know buying devices, you can buy just accelerometers or, I, or or gyroscopes or the combined one which is axle gyro or axle gyro magnetometer. You can also buy INSs, which does the processing of the signals also for you, and it kind of does that little bit of perception for you. But we want to learn how to do that from scratch. So, um, because there's a lot of very important details in, in, in how it should be done uh, properly. So, for dead reckoning, uh, again, the problem statement is you have some robot, some vehicle, something that is moving with respect to a global reference frame, right, which is fixed. So, uh, we call that S, S sub G, so that's our fixed uh, world reference frame or the global reference frame. Again, it can point to fixed geographical directions like northeast, down, or something like that. And then you have an INS on your robot, which is accelerometer, gyroscope, plus a little bit of additional signal processing, the signals that you get out of your accelerometer and gyroscope, the device has no idea about your world coordinates, right? So it's going to report these quantities, which are accelerations and angular velocities, in its own reference frame, right? So whatever, like if this blue box is your is your IMU, it's going to have its own XYZ uh, coordinates. We call it S sub B for the, that's the body reference frame of the device. And the values the device is going to report is with respect to its own uh, uh, reference frame, right? So in order to be able to do that reckoning, of course, it's only useful in, in, in our global reference frame. So we need to transform the readouts of the device from its body reference frame to the global reference frame before we integrate those, right? So very concretely, let's say you have an accelerometer on some vehicle, and it's telling you you're going in x direction with an acceleration of 1 meters per second squared. But what is x direction with respect to geographical coordinates? Is it pointing to the north? Is it south? Is it east? Is it west? Is it something in between? You need to know that and then transform that readout from the body coordinates to the global coordinates before you integrate and do dead reckoning. That's a critical step that needs to be done, okay? So, uh, because of that, there's two different types of inertial navigation systems. Uh, one is called a stable platform INS. So, stable platform INS, what it does is that uh, it has what we call gimbals, which are these, like it has like a moving platform inside the device with motors uh, in it in, in three axes. And it uses the readouts from the gyroscope. And as soon as it senses there is some rotation being applied, it corrects for it. So it always aligns your accelerometers with the global, um, um, basically external global uh, reference frame, right? And it's doing that by physically moving the device, right? So as you can imagine, the stable platform INS has become these, you know, big clunky things with multiple motors and gimbals and things like that. Uh, and uh, they're big, they're expensive, they have, you know, a, 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 a lot of limitations, but they also can be very, very accurate. So for instance, in spacecrafts, in very expensive airplanes, these type of accelerometers uh, are, are, are used, a stable platform. And by that, basically correcting for the the, you know, the orientation of the device and always aligning it with an external reference frame, you always, basically you eliminate the problem of having two different reference frames because you always actively align your sensor to the external reference. So your S sub B, which is your body reference coordinates, is always equal to the global reference coordinates, right? So that's a stable platform. And uh, let's, let's see a quick movie of, of, of one of these because these are fascinating things. So, so um, 
if this plays. Yeah, um, before I play it, so, so this is one, it's, it's, this, it's a big thing. It's almost the size of this little stand that, that, that I'm, I'm, I'm using. And this is the one that is used in, the, in, in some fighter jets. And I think a version of this was also sent to the moon on, on, the, on the Apollo mission. And here they're testing it, so you would see how, so it needs to apply rotations in three axes, right? So that it can correct for yaw, pitch, and roll. And, uh, and that's the thing. Uh, you see it can rotate in, in, in three axes. Uh, it can do it very fast. Here they're just testing it. You really don't need the audio here, but you get the idea, right? I think this one is called LN3, yeah, LN32A. Um, so, so it works, uh, and it does a very good job with, with aligning things, uh, but, but it's also pretty clunky and expensive and big. Um, cheap versions of, of these you might have seen like uh, YouTubers around which have these little gimbals with their phone on it and, it and it always kind of, you know, it's like a little thing with a handle and it always, you know, stabilizes the phone to, to, to get rid of, uh, you know, vibrations and things like that. Those work with the exact same principle. So they have basically gyros inside and there's a motorized gimbal and it stabilizes the thing and always aligns it with the same external uh, frame of reference. Then we have a strap down INS, which, uh, which basically has, has, has none of these you know, active control stuff. So it's exactly just one chip um, uh, with, with gyroscopes and accelerometers inside, and it has no way of correcting this basically uh, uh, the discrepancy between the body reference frame with uh, the, the global reference frame mechanically, so it has to be done in signal processing, right? And the strap down INS is the one we'll study in detail because uh, that's, that's the, uh, the, the most common one in you know, the types of robotic applications uh, that uh, most likely you would be dealing with. Okay, so when it comes to um, doing dead reckoning or inertial navigation with the, these two different types of systems. Let's look at the INS, uh, the stable platform INS first. So with the stable platform INS, uh, um, you, you, you basically, uh, again, your accelerometer is always aligned with your global reference coordinates. So it's very easy. You just take the accelerometer readouts, you subtract the gravity component, Right? You should always subtract the gravity component because uh, the, the, gra the gravity component that the device senses is actually through contact. So that's, again, if it's like sitting on this table, it's going to sense a 1G pointing up. Uh, and that's, you know, just the balancing force applied through the contact to balance out the, uh, the pull of, of, of gravity. So you always want to subtract that out because that doesn't cause any motion, right? So subtract the gravity, then you get accelerations in, in the global reference frame. You integrate once, you get velocity, you integrate again, you get global position. Very easy, right? So that's a stable platform. It's not what we're gonna study, that's too easy for us. So we're gonna look at strap down. With strap down, what you do, you need to do a little bit of sensor fusion between your gyroscope and, and accelerometers. So from the gyroscope readouts, uh, which are angular velocities, uh, if you integrate those, and we'll see how to integrate them, you can get essentially the orientation relative to the global reference frames. And you use that orientation information to transform your accelerometer readouts from the body frame to the global frame. So you apply this 3D rotation basically to your accelerometer readouts. Then you can subtract uh, gravity components and then you get acceleration in the global reference frame. You can integrate once to get velocity, integrate again to get position. So essentially uh, what this step does for you transforming uh, which uses the gyroscope input, right, or the integrated gyroscope input to apply that transformation, that is the algorithmic equivalent of what a stable INS does for you mechanically, right? So the stable uh, 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 um, INS just mechanically moves the thing to align it. In the strap down, you apply a rotation in math or in DSP or in algorithms to do the alignment. So the end effect is the same. You want to get accelerations in the global frame and then integrate those for uh, basically to get uh, dead reckoning. Okay, um, 
I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I think we talked about pros and cons of both types of INSS. So again, stable platform, big and clunky, lots of moving things. It's also uh, prone to um, a bunch of very specific failures. Uh, there's a particularly bad one which is called gimbal lock that you can look at, but that's the case where these three gimbals get into this weird state and then they cannot basically get out of it and uh, you need to reset the device basically. Um, but the, 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 uh, what's good about it is that your navigation algorithms are extremely straightforward. You just take acceleration, you know it's already aligned to uh, global reference frame, just integrate it twice, and that gives you basically position. Um, but they're expensive and only used in essentially like space and military applications. Strap down devices are very, very small and cheap and reliable. There's no moving parts, no mechanical parts, tiny, low power. Um, but the uh, trade off is basically they would need more complex algorithms to. Uh, to do this alignment of the body frame to the uh, global reference frame. Okay, let's just set up the problem real quick for uh, orientation tracking and then we'll finish it next time together. So uh, again, with, we're talking about strap down inertial navigation and the first thing you need to know, do is you would need to align the readouts off your accelerometer to the global reference frame and to be able to do the alignment, you need to know the orientation of your device. You need to know, okay, I'm pointing to 30 degrees with respect to geographical north, and if you know that orientation, then you can apply the inverse rotation to align your measurements to the global reference frame. Okay, so uh, to track orientation, uh, we use gyroscope. And gyroscope, as we know, it gives you, if it's a three-axis gyroscope, it gives you three readouts, right? It gives you angular velocities uh, uh, relative to x, y, and z directions of the device, right? So that's why there's a subscript B here. So these are measurements in the body reference frame of, of the device, right? So that's your uh, gyroscope readouts. And uh, at a high level, to track orientation, also called the attitude of the device, what you need to do, the angular velocities are the, are the rates of rotation, right? So if you integrate the rate of rotation, then, then you should be able to get uh, the actual orientation or the pose of the device. So you basically, at a high level, you want to integrate omega or, or the three components of the omega to find the orientation in the global reference frame. Uh, to do that, you need to parameterize uh, the, the, the problem properly, and there is uh, different parameterizations for orientation tracking. Uh, most common ones are Euler angles is one, uh, there's uh, quaternions, and there is direction cosines. And there is, you know, mathematically, I mean, at the end of the day, they all are different mathematical uh, parameterizations or representations to solve the same underlying problem of tracking orientation. But it turns out that with different formulations, uh, there's you know pros and cons to how you do the math. I particularly like direction cosines, and that's what I'm going to use. Uh, but you would see in robotics, for instance, quaternions are, are very common. Um, uh, Euler angles, I don't recommend them much because um, there is uh, very specific you know, sources of confusion when it comes to Euler angles. Um, there's nothing really wrong with them, but they're prone to, you know, making, uh, making errors, kind of. Uh, so we'll use direction cosines. And uh, in our formulation uh, with, with the direction cosines specifically, uh, we'll work with uh, this matrix we call C sub G. And what C sub G is, it's a rotation matrix that basically, so if you look at the two uh, reference frames, one is the fixed for world and one is your body, um, the transformation between these two is just a rotation, right? So if you find the right rotation, which we call matrix, which we call C sub G, and apply the inverse of it to the, to the uh, 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 body reference frame, it will rotate it back and align it with the global reference frame. Um, so in the 3D case, your C sub G is going to be a three by three rotation matrix. And specifically what it's given by is that its three columns are basically the, the three basis vectors of your body frame of reference as represented in the global reference frame, right? So specifically if X sub B, Y sub B, and Z sub B 
are uh, the, the, the three axes of your um, uh, uh, body frame of reference, your C sub G, this first column is just X hat B, right? It's the unit vector in the X B direction, Y hat B and Z hat B. So this is the, the matrix that we are trying to find using um, the readouts of the gyroscope. And if you can find this matrix, and it's going to be a time varying matrix, right? It's a function of time because we are constantly rotating. If you find that, then you can basically use that to rotate back your accelerometer met readouts to the global frame. And then from there, it's just pure integration to do dead reckoning. OK, so that's a problem set up. We'll solve it together uh, next time. Any questions? All right, see you next time. Thank you.